Okay. And I have no interest in gender or race or anything like that. But everyone else is kind of with their little calculating, is this the exact right mix? You know, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's, uh, to me, it's anti-comedy. It's okay. anti-comedy. It's, it's more about, you know, PC nonsense okay. than are you making us laugh or not? Right. Because you're offended, it doesn't mean you're right. Recently, a lot of right-wing comedians have complained about cancel culture ruining comedy. One prominent example they make is about pushback for LGBTQ jokes. They claim that people like Richard Pryor never faced any backlash for these jokes, but they don't know about the time Richard Pryor was booed off stage at the Hollywood Bowl and labeled a homophobic bigot on the front page of newspapers the next day. The year was 1977 and the headline was, Richard Pryor loses it again at the Hollywood Bowl. Unfortunately, it wasn't that simple. That night, the Hollywood Bowl had a potent mixture of people and personalities ready to combust. What happened wasn't Richard Pryor losing his mind. It was Richard Pryor holding up a mirror to the wealthy white elites of the LGBTQ community, and they didn't like it. As always, we'll need some backstory on the key players here. There's Richard Pryor, and in my opinion, one of the greatest stand-up comedians of all time, and a pretty solid actor. He did cocaine. Everyone knew this. Even before he reached the peak of his career in the late 70s and early 80s, there were plenty of headlines about him losing his mind. I remember this one. It was striked a match like this. No. It's like, what's that? Richard Pryor running down the street. Next, there's Lily Tomlin, a comedian and actress. She's most known for starring alongside Dolly Parton in 9 to 5. Don't you ever refer to me as your girl again. What in God's name are you talking about? Dorlita, what are we going to do about this chair? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm no girl. I'm a woman. Do you hear me? I'm not your wife or your mother or even your mistress. What? She was openly lesbian long before this night ever happened. She also considered herself a close friend of Richard's at the time. Next is the Lockers, a group of young black dancers who had been on Soul Train, appeared in music videos, and toured the country performing. Anita Bryant wasn't there that night, but plays a key role. She was a jingle singer. She attempted to make it as a professional recording artist, but she was unlikable. Her music wasn't great. Honestly, she's just a trash individual. She pivoted into politics and became an anti-gay activist. That didn't work out for her either. She she was a joke still. In fact, years later, Family Guy would make fun of her, basing the character Pearl on her. On one occasion, she was giving a speech and a protester ran up and hit her in the face with a pile on national TV. And, uh, uh, every- oh, oh, oh. Security agent! Security agent! No, no, let him stay. No. Let him stay. Well, at least stay. it's a fruit pie. She's only important because her antics caused the formation of our last player. In 1977, she was at the front of pushing legislation in Florida that would essentially make it illegal to be homosexual. The Don't Say Gay Bill passed in Florida has been in the works for almost half a century. In 1977, this led to the formation of our last player, the Save Our Human Rights Foundation. That was their name, but in reality, they had no interest in human rights for everyone. Just gay and lesbian rights. Nothing for bisexuals or trans people, nothing for poor people, nothing for immigrants or disabled people, hell, nothing for non-white gays and lesbians. It was made up almost entirely white, gay, and lesbians with corporate or government jobs in San Francisco. Their goal was to educate people in a quote, nice, glossy way. The Save Our Human Rights Foundation decided to hold an event at the Hollywood Bowl, a fundraiser with performances by many different talents, but there were some caveats. See, their idea of educating people about lesbian and gay people was to not say lesbian or gay. None of the performers could say gay or lesbian, and nobody could talk about sex. With that in mind, 17 to 18,000 people filled the Hollywood Bowl that night. Richard Pryor is backstage, walking the hall, set the headline. He's picking up on the tone of the event and he's getting pissed off. He was sure he was there to do a benefit for human rights, but as he watches the performers get on stage and avoid the top completely, it just makes him matter. That night, the lockers performed a dance routine that wasn't received well. The stage crew refused to set the lights for them. They had changed the lights for every white performer before and after. The sound mixing was bad and they were outright treated like trash. The audience completely ignored their performance. A dancer leaped over nine chairs and was met with silence and yawns. They had been cussed out, made fun of, and ridiculed killed by event organizers backstage and Pryor is pissed off. Lily Tomlin comes up to perform and for the first time that day, she breaks the rules. She talks about sex, talks about being a lesbian. She tells the crowd she misses when sex was quote, 
dirty and nasty and nobody was gay, only shy. And the crowd laughs, but organizers hate it despite knowing what a Lily Tomlin set looked like before they even booked her for the show. It's an eventful day and Richard Pryor is about the headline. He comes on stage and doesn't say anything. He walks the length of the stage several times, looking out into the thousands of white people gathered there that evening. When he finally speaks, he says, I came here for human rights. And I found out it was really about not getting caught with a dick in your mouth. The crowd laughs harder than they have all night. He keeps going. You don't want the police to kick your ass if you're sucking dick. And that's fair. You've got a right to suck anything you want. Again, the crowd goes wild. Richard then goes on to talk about a man named Wilbur Hart that he grew up with. I have sucked a dick. He said the other boys would let Wilbur suck their dicks, but Richard would quote, take him roses and call him my dear. He said, I sucked one dick. In 1952, I sucked Wilbur Harvey's dick. It was beautiful, but I had to leave it alone. He would continue, it was beautiful because Wilbur had the best booty in the world. Now I'm not saying booty to be nice. I'm talking about asshole. Wilbur had some good asshole. The crowd is hanging on his every word and Pryor was more explicit about his relations with Wilbur than I can be on YouTube. That's when Richard supposedly loses his mind. He pauses, looks into the crowd, and he asks them, how can faggots be racist? There's silence. It's the first time in my life I ever realized that faggots are prejudiced. Cause I don't see no niggas out here. <laughs> Then he gives them a list of all the racist things he saw that night, and the crowd gets really quiet. He dedicates a lot of time to just how bad the lockers have been treated that night, and he goes on to say, I hope the police catch you motherfuckers and shoot you in the ass accidentally because you motherfuckers ain't helping niggas at all. The crowd is mad. They start to boo. Pryor continues, motherfuck women's rights. What they need to do is pay the people on welfare. At this point, the whole crowd is booing because he's crossed the line, but Pryor doesn't stop. He continues with, yeah, get mad because you're going to be even madder than that when Ed Davis catches you motherfuckers out here in the lot. And when the niggas was burning down, watch you motherfuckers was doing what you wanted to do on Hollywood Boulevard. Didn't give a shit about it and kiss my happy, rich, black ass. That's not even how the story ends. I mentioned the Save Our Human Rights Foundation was basically wealthy white people. Well, they made calls. The next morning, Pryor was all over the newspapers in Los Angeles. The LA Times ran a full page spread demanding he apologize. Over the next 17 issues, they shared letters of people at the Hollywood Bowl that evening calling Pryor homophobic, claiming his quote, street language was offensive and they couldn't be racist because they had black friends. But the campaign against Pryor didn't go as planned for two reasons. The first is they forgot all LGBTQ people aren't wealthy, skinny white people. More people came out in defense of Pryor than anyone could have expected. Pryor has shined a light on one of the darkest parts of the LGBTQ community, and that was the fact that racism was still prevalent and running rampant. One person interviewed stated, being a black homosexual and living here practically all my life, I can say that the California homosexual is the most extreme of bigots. He hates blacks, bats, women, and himself most of all. Pryor's actions were crude, but sadly true. If one refuses to believe, let any person who is fat, black, ugly, or female try to go to a gay club alone. The second reason the campaign failed is because they ignored Richard Pryor's past. Believe it or not, there are many people who don't place a label on their sexual orientation. Pryor was one of them. He once joked that he was ready to go back to being a horny heterosexual. But beyond that, nothing. For starters, Wilbur Harp was a real person. Pryor's close friend Cecil Grubbs had confirmed that Wilbur was an openly gay teenager they grew up with in Peoria, Illinois. Pryor and Harp would spend hours together at a bar called The Blue Shadow. In the 1960s, Pryor and Harp moved to Chicago together and shared an apartment while Harp worked as a cosmetologist. Even after Pryor made it big, he would still fly out Harp for lengthy vacations in LA until Harp died. Quincy Jones once let it slip that Richard Pryor and Marlon Brando would have sex frequently. Brando also never placed labels on his sexual orientation, but was very open about the fact that he had sex with women and men. Pryor's widow, Jennifer Lee Pryor, would go on to confirm she knew about it, even joking in New York Magazine saying, it was the 70s and drugs were still good, especially quaaludes. If you did enough cocaine, you'd fuck a radiator and send it flowers in the morning. The Hollywood Bowl wasn't even the first or last time Richard Pryor would talk about sleeping with men on stage. In his very first special, Live and Smoking, he would discuss having gay sex. Never fuck a faggot, cause they will lie. They always say, I don't tell, they lie. They can't wait till you finish fucking them. Well, guess who was here, honey? <laughs> Girl, look here. Well, the nigga got more bitch in him than me. During some banter between the scenes on the Richard Pryor show, he talked to the crowd about having sex with Paul Mooney. Uh, uh, I, I sure wish you'd be my red handkerchief. <laughs> my wife got 
been wondering where he was. <laughs> in his autobiography, Pryor spoke about his trans girlfriend being a new experience for him. Going back to where we started, Richard Pryor probably faced more retaliation from the LGBTQ community than any milk toast commonly complaining about cancel culture today. It's because Richard Pryor shined a light on racism plaguing the LGBTQ community that still goes on today. They're in part of DC, so they have to work within DC. If they don't want to be within DC, then move the campus. I think we should need to work together, and I don't think it should be a he or he or there or here. It's our community, and that's how it should be. In 2023, the only clips of that performance available were used in a documentary calling it the most homophobic rant in comedy history. The wealthy elite stereotypical gay men and lesbians that filled the Hollywood Bowl that night refused to acknowledge that every single member of the LGBTQ community isn't going to fit neatly in their boxes. It wasn't because he was standing on stage saying hateful things and called it comedy. He faced that criticism because the call was coming from inside the house and white people once again refused to reckon with their own racist actions.